going to ask you to uh, turn in your Bibles to, uh, to the book of 1 Thessalonians. We carry on in 1 Thessalonians as we commit the learning and the teaching of God's Word before Him this morning. Come, let us pray. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the grave. Oh Lord, may we ponder oh, the power in this declaration as we recognize and are reminded once again of what you have done in giving life to once dead souls, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you would just cause us to be alert once again this morning to a message, Lord, which is pertinent and a message which is relevant in these last days. And so, Father, I ask that you would make our eyes to see. That, Lord, you would make our ears to hear. That you would cause our minds to understand. And not just that, Lord, but that our hearts might receive and respond appropriately to your word today. That we might prove by experience that good, acceptable, and that perfect will of God. And I find myself once again this morning, Lord, so uh, aware of and so overwhelmed by my own inadequacies. But my prayer, Jesus, is that I would offer nothing but you. And as I seek to do that, Lord, may I decrease that Christ might increase in this place. In your name and for your fame, we do pray. Amen. Amen. So we're in our series through the book of First Thessalonians as we continue uh, in Paul's letter to the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to do a recap. If you've missed any of that, you can... Uh, you can catch up on the previous uh, eight um, parts uh, on our web page. You can get a hold of that. Uh, but today we're going to find ourselves in um, in First Thessalonians chapter five, and we're going to, in a moment, be reading verses one through to eleven this morning. So, if you have your Bibles, why don't you open to First Thessalonians chapter five, verse verse one? Okay, there we go. Okay, um, so why don't you just follow with me in your Bibles, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm reading from the New King James Version this morning. Here's what Paul writes. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day, and we are not of, of the night nor of darkness. Let us, uh, therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the, of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Verse 11 reads, Therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. The heart of today's message, church. Okay, so, well, let's get to the title then. So the title this morning is, as we carry on in our series, is Living Straight in a Crooked World. Today in these 11 verses, we want to look at how important it is for us to wake up, for us to clean up, and for us to dress up because Jesus is coming back. Amen? So church, we need to wake up, we need to clean up, 
And we need to dress up. And so the heart of today's message, we are to live as children of light, speaking a message of truth as we look toward Christ's return. To live as children of light, speaking a message of truth as we look toward Christ's return. So last week we looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through to 18, where the Apostle Paul was talking about two things. Firstly, he was talking about the resurrection of those who sleep in Christ. That on that day when Christ returns, we will see the resurrection, Christ calling from the, from the grave, uh, those who have gone on before us, who understood relationship and enjoyed relationship with Jesus Christ. And then he talked about the rapture to come. That day when Christ returns and he will draw to himself the bride of Christ, the church, and we will be caught up with him in the heavens. And so we ended off on that, on that high note, on that joyful and that exciting note of Christ's return. But as we come to, uh, into chapter 5, we suddenly find that there's a shift and there's a change that takes place. And suddenly Paul is speaking about a horrible and a terrible event which is going to happen and which will face those who reject salvation in Jesus Christ. It is going to be this cataclysmic culmination of God's righteous judgment on those who are determined over and over again, yes, we have heard of Jesus Christ, but no, we will not accept His offer of salvation. And so all of salvation history is moving toward this point in time of which Paul is speaking in, in uh, first list. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we go, everything is culminating toward that day. And it's going to be a terrible day. In fact, the Bible refers to it as the day of the Lord. It is a phrase which is used many times over and over and over again. We find the, the phrase, the day of the Lord, in the Old Testament. And whenever, whenever the Old Testament speaks of the day of the Lord, it is speaking about God's righteous judgment on sin. And yet, as we look at the Old Testament, those are all little days which are leading up to the big day which is coming. It's almost like these, you know, the, 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 the pre preliminary games before the big one. It's kind of like what's going to take place. Today we, we're starting fun volleyball, okay, and there are going to be all these preliminary games that are going to build up to that big game when, when us old guys thrash the AFJ team. Okay, it's the, yeah, it's the... You, you guys, right? You see, these guys are excited about it, and these guys are looking intimidated up front here. Okay, it's all these preliminary days that are, that, that are moving toward that big day, the day of the Lord. And so how do we live straight in a crooked world? We wake up, we clean up, and we get dressed up for that day. And let's go through this passage, and Paul says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And so Paul's writing to the guys, and these believers were very aware that that day was coming. And church, we need to be reminded, and we need to be aware, and we need, or rather we need to be on guard and make sure that we're not asleep when that day happens. How many of you will remember in the, in the 90s uh, a, uh, a TV series called Early Edition? Any of you guys remember Early Edition? Okay, there we go. Do you guys remember that? You guys were wandering around in nappy store. Okay. <laughs> it's the Early Edition. It was a story, a series of a guy who would receive uh, the, the, the uh, newspaper one day ahead of time. So in other words, he would receive tomorrow's newspaper today. And what would happen is he would be committed to, now you guys remember, right? There we go, right. And he'd be committed to going out, and, uh, and because he had tomorrow's headlines today, he would do everything he, he could to avert disaster in people's lives. He would do everything he could to avert uh, any unpleasant experiences that people would face. And so he would come along and he would rescue and he would save people because he had the early edition on life's events. And if you have a Bible, and if you read your Bible, then church, I want to suggest to you that you have an early edition on what's going on in this world. We have a peek into an early edition of what's happening. And if we look at our world today, we needn't be surprised or alarmed or dismayed at what's taking place because we have an early edition. The Bible tells us that the things that we see happening around about us, the Bible makes clear that these things are going to happen. 
And so if we have the Bible, if we have a Bible and we study it, we need not be caught or taken by surprise. And the Bible says that Jesus will come as a thief in the night. And that great day of the Lord will happen as a thief in the night. You know, you don't have, uh, I don't think any of you have ever woken up and found a note in your letterbox, uh, I'll see you tonight, signed thief. Okay? You ever have that experience? No. Okay? And so we may not know the exact day and we may not know the exact hour, but we have an early addition and a peek into what's happening. And here's the assurance is Jesus is coming back again. And here's what uh, Matthew 24 says. Um, tell us. So the disciples are asking Jesus, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Give us a heads up so we know exactly when this is going to happen. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see that you are not, what? Troubled. Any of us here today troubled? Jesus says when you look at the world and you see what a mess it's in, He says, don't be troubled. He says, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom will rise against kingdom. He says, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. All these things need to happen. All these things need to unravel in order for me to come back. And as you look at your early edition, isn't that the world in which we live today? In fact, we've heard people like, what's his name, Jim Jones and others who, uh, who who's, you know, came forward and said, you know, look to me, I'm the answer uh, to, to man's uh, problems. In fact, Cassandra and I a few months ago uh, watched a documentary of Jim Jones' life. Man, it's, have any of you guys ever watched it or read his life story and that mass suicide? You know, he, you know, he got everyone together in this camp and said, we're, we're going to take poison now and we're on our way out. And, he, and, and, you know, he proclaimed to, to be the answer to man's problems. And so we find that many have already done that. And so we may not know the day and we may not know the answer, but it seems, friends, that our world is in its final hours. That these are the last days. And that soon, as we looked at last week, that we're going to hear the shout of Christ, we're going to hear the shout of the archangel, and we're going to hear the trumpet of God. And what, and what Paul is talking about here, he says, uh, he says that there is tragedy coming for those who reject Christ. Listen to what he says. He says, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. And when he talks about peace and safety, what he's saying is it will just be life as normal. And as you look at this world, world today, isn't that how people are living? It's just life as normal. People are just plodding on. People are planning on what they'll do tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. In fact, the Lord has challenged me these days. If I say to you, you know, see you tomorrow, Lord willing. Because we don't know when that day or that hour will be. And, and, and in fact, um, I thought about Gordon. I'm glad Gordon and Debs are here back from their holiday. Because I know this passage of Scripture is something that's close to your heart, Gordon. Matthew 24. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, people will be saying, no, there's peace and safety. No, it's life is normal. Tomorrow will always be there, just as in the days of Noah. For 120 years, Noah faithfully and obediently hammered away and sawed away and planed away and built the ark that God had instructed him to build. For 120 years, the people around him were determined to be indifferent to the message of salvation, to a call to righteousness and repentance of sin. For 120 years, they said, we'll still be indifferent. And this is the world in which we live. People insist on being indifferent to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as I said last week, this is not a message that we hear a lot about from the pulpit. 
And instead, when we look at world events and what's going on in our world, these th things seem to be the things which capture our attention. I'm not saying we must live uh, naive about what's going on in our world, but the thing which ought to gr grip our hearts and minds most and greatest is the fact that Jesus is coming back again. Forget the headlines in the newspapers. Look at the headline in the Word of God. Jesus saying, I'm coming back. Signed, Jesus. And so as in the days of Noah, so it shall be in these days. Right up until that point in time when they watched Noah rally up the animals, when he, they watched Noah and the seven members of his family make their, way, make their way into the ark, and still they were indifferent until the flood came and they perished. Peace and safety. Relax. Don't be so high strung. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. Life's going on. And as I've been going through this book, there's just a burden that is, that is building up in my heart, church for the lost. Yes, there's this comparison that Paul is drawing of, of those who will, who will face, face judgment and those who will, who will be before the Lord as our Savior and sometimes we think we've made it safely into the church and we don't care about those who are going to hell. We watched a powerful message by Paul Washer with our senior youth this last Friday. And we, you know, we often talk about this. Heaven is real, right? But hell is just as real. We often say, Lord, uh, give me a heart for a burden for the lost. You ever said that? Lord, give me a burden for the lost. Anyone guilty of that? I, I'm guilty of praying that. God did give us a burden. Matthew 28 is that burden, going to all the world, preaching the good news, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's our burden. We need to qu quit asking God to give us the burden, and we need to start doing something about that burden. It says, and then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. If you've ever been pregnant, you don't, you don't need Paul to expand on what he's saying there. Okay. You know, you build up, the months build up, where's Leah? A yeah, couple of months to go. The months build up, and you're looking toward that day, and you may have an idea, especially with technology today, you may have an idea of the day, but you don't know the exact hour. But what you do know, and take note, my friend Phil, what you do know is when that hour comes, <laughs> when those contractions happen, and you're watching uh, Super Sport, or he's probably watching Nat Geo Wild or something, and Leah says, you know, Phil, I think we need to get going. You know, you don't say, Leah, let's just finish this episode, okay? That's not going to happen. All right, there's going to be a sense of urgency. Uh, you know, these, these pains that are coming just won't go away. And there will be no escape. No escape. And so, church, I just want to stop a moment and just ask us, do we have a burden for the lost? Man, when we look at this great and terrible day of the Lord, does it make our hearts break as we look at what people will face if they reject Jesus? The fact that people are going to go into an eternity without Jesus. Man, it ought to make us uncomfortable in our pews. It ought to break us out of this complacency of Christianity. And Paul goes on and he says, but you, and, he, and he's turning toward the believers now, he says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and let us be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. And here Paul's drawing contrasts. Uh, the contrast between light and darkness, sleeping and walking, night and day, us and them, wrath and salvation. He says, but you, brethren, should not be living as unbelievers. But you, brethren, should not be living and walking in darkness as some are doing. So what he's saying is, listen, church, we cannot afford to be caught sleeping when Jesus comes. 
And listen, it, and, and we need to understand something here. It's not about, and Paul Washer touched on this on Friday night when we watched this, this DVD. It's not about whether you just say, well, I, 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 have, I have faith in Jesus Christ. If we're not living in the light as Christ is in the light, we cannot expect God to pour out kindness upon us on that day when he returns. It's not just about being called a Christian. It's not just about uttering a prayer. It's not just about being found in Sunday meetings. It's not just about being found at home fellowships midweek fellowships. It's about living in the light as Christ is in the light. Amen, church. Amen. It's about getting out of this, this mundane motions of Christianity and getting into the reality of what it means to be a believer in the 21st century and how our lives impact the world in which we live. And we've become dull of hearing and we've become complacent in many ways. When I say we, I'm talking about the contemporary church of what it means to be a Christian. There are those who belong to the light and there are those who belong to the darkness. There are two kinds of people. And what Paul is saying is you want to live straight in a crooked world, make sure that you're walking in the light as Christ is in the light. He uses a word here, he uses two words. He says, be watchful, or he says, be alert. In fact, we talked about watch and pray in one of the, got my notes here from what we were singing, right? Be watchful and be prayerful. In fact, we talked about, I'll walk upon salvation. What does it mean to walk upon salvation? It means that everything I do and every decision I make and every way I live is in light of the fact that Christ is coming back. That's what it means to walk upon salvation. It doesn't mean that, Jesus, you've, you've washed my sins away and, uh, and I've just, you know, you've snatched me from, 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 the, from the, uh, the flames of, of hell. It doesn't just mean that. To walk upon eternity means to live in light of Christ's return. Christ is coming back. And so many of us live in light of what's going on around about us today. That's why so many of us have our faith shaken or stolen or robbed. Is because we live according to the headlines of today's world. Let me tell you, if you want to go to the headlines of the Sunday Times or the Herald or the H Metro or the Independent or anything else, you're not getting anything good out of that. There's no good news there. All that we find there is what Scripture is talking about. And so, in fact, you know, let, let, let me go back. Here's what uh, Paul says. He says, in those last days, he says, preachers will be preaching. He says, teachers will be teaching. He says, lawyers will be arbitrating. Doctors will be treating people. And, uh, and politicians will be lying. Okay? <laughs> right? If we're talking treating, teaching, preaching, lying. Right? Lawyers will continue to be lying in those last days. Not lawyers, politicians. <laughs> George is here. George, forgive me, not lawyers. Lawyers arbitrate. George is going to have a meeting with Tim on Monday morning. <laughs> and he says you be watchful and be alert. And what it means is to make a determined effort to stay awake. In fact, some of you need to practice that in my sermons. You need to make a determined effort to stay awake. And those of you who are laughing are probably the guilty ones. <laughs> make a determined effort to spiritually stay awake in these last days. Because some are falling asleep. Some are falling asleep. The Greek word sleep is, is, a, is the word kathudo. And when we look at it in this context, it refers to spiritual lethargy and negligence with a view to Christ's return. Have you become spiritually lethargic or have you become ne uh, negligent with regards to Christ's return? Some may grow weary, others may lose heart, others still may go back to the ways of the world, but we must stay awake spiritually. And he says you must be sober-minded. In other words, be serious about these things. It, des it describes a person with spiritual poise in a crooked and an unsettled world. That's what it means to be sober. It's to still have your poise in, an, in, in a crooked and a perverse generation. A person who's not overly excited by the events around about us, nor a person who's indifferent to what's going on. How unsettled are we by the things in this world? Such a person has a calm outlook on life, even if there's tragic news, even if there's news that shakes our hearts or shakes our world, we recognize that we do not lose heart because we're going toward that moment in time. 
And here's what he says. He says, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. What comes to mind when we read that? It's what Vimbaya was sharing, Ephesians 6. But I'd like to suggest that even before that, that, that Paul's actually making a reference to the book of Isaiah. Not actually to Ephesians, but Ephesians is tied up in that. When we talk about Jesus, he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing. And he wrapped himself with, the ze with zeal as a mantle. When, when he's figuratively speaking about the Lord here, he's talking about how the Lord armed himself for the deliverance of his people even in a wicked and a perverse generation. That's what he's talking about, how the, how the Lord armed himself. And then as he uses this terminology to describe us in these last days, he says, so we ought to arm ourselves in that same way. So we need to put on righteousness like a breastplate. We need to put on a helmet of salvation. When we talk about the breastplate of faith, he talks about the breastplate of faith and love. Faith in God is what gives us spiritual stability in these times. In these last days, it's faith in God which will give us spiritual stability. We may not have political stability. We may not have social stability. We may not have economic stability. But church, what we need above everything else or above all else is we need spiritual stability so that we do not lose hope. So I'm glad you're here. Amen. Eh? So that we do not lose hope. And then he talks about love, and, and, and I was thinking through this. What is the love that he talks about here? What do you think the love is that he's talking about here? Breastplate plate of faith and love. There's a sense in which he's talking about the love which we ought to have for one another, right? But greater than that, I'd like to suggest to you that he's talking about the love that we have. For his great appearing. Does that make sense? You know, I would imagine in, in Phil's heart there is building up a love in his heart toward that day, two months from now, when, 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 his, when his baby will arrive. There's a love in, in Leah's heart that's building up toward that day. There's a sense of anticipation and expectation. And, and I'd like to suggest, here's what, uh, what 2 Timothy says. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day and not to me only, but also to all who what? Who loved His appearing. And that's what I believe that Paul's talking about here. He says it's that kind of love, that kind of passion, that kind of expectation and anticipation that toward that day when Christ returns, do you have a love that is just stirring up in your heart for that day when finally, finally, Jesus, you've come back to get your bride? Are you excited about that day? In fact, let me see what else we sang here. When before the throne I stand in Him complete. Are you excited about that day when finally completion will take place? When we stand before His throne, God, I am finally complete. Jeez, you guys don't look excited. Are you excited about that day? He says the, the, the helmet, uh, as a helmet, the hope of salvation. What does a helmet do? Protects. Protects the head. And that, that, that helmet of salvation to protect our minds in these last days that we might be watchful and prayerful and sober-minded so that we're not taken off track. And what is, what is our hope of salvation, church? What is our hope of salvation? It gives it to us here. Here is our hope that God did not appoint us to wrath. Do you guys realize that? That God could have said, you know what? You all deserve wrath. God could have written us all off and said, I appoint all of you to wrath because of your sin. That's what you deserve. But God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we're awake or whether we're asleep, we should live together with Him for all of eternity. The basis of hope is God's appointment of us, not to wrath, but to salvation. Do you guys get that? God could have all written us off and signed us off to wrath. And he said, but instead I'm going to sign you guys off to salvation on account of what Jesus did. And then let's just end this. Let's just close this year. 
He says, therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. Does this sound familiar? Hands up if you were here last week. Put your hand up. This should sound familiar to you. It's how 1 Thessalonians 4.18 ended. Therefore, comfort one another. In other words, encourage one another. This is good news. The world is going downhill. The world is in a mess. We have an early edition. Jesus said, don't be troubled. These things are going to happen. But they have to happen in order for me to come back. And so comfort one another and edify one another just as you're doing. Encourage one another with the good news and build one another up. All the more so as we see that day approaching. In other words, we come alongside each other and say, friend, you need to finish strong. You need to finish well. Let's keep going. And so as I close this morning, and as we gaze into the mirror of God's word, what Paul is really saying is, wake up. Have you fallen asleep? Wake up. And then the next thing that he says is you need to clean up. You need to check yourself and ask yourself, am I in the light as he is in the light? And then he says, dress up. Put on the armor of God. Prepare for battle. My wife said I mustn't use phrases like this, but prepare for battle because it's going down. Okay? <laughs> it is going down. And I had this long lecture last Sunday. As I drove to the art exhibition. Now you mustn't use those words. I get excited in the pulpit and I use these words and then other guys bring in Pitbull and these other guys. That's not who I was talking about, right? And some of you are saying, Pitbull, don't worry about it. <laughs> but it's going down. And we cannot be guilty, found guilty of sleepwalking. No, let me just say that. <laughs> it's going, it's in Natalie's head now. May God give us a burden, or, or rather, may we not ask God to give us a burden for the lost, but may we understand He's already given us that burden. Even if it's just one person. If God can use us to rescue one person from the pit of hell. Please, let's ask the Lord to make us uncomfortable and discontent with just being here Sunday by Sunday. We've got to reach out to the lost. Another thing that we need to examine as we look into God's Word, is there anything in my life that is characteristic of darkness? Lord, am I guilty in any way of walking in darkness? And I, I, I point that at myself. And man, now God is doing open heart surgery in my life. Because sometimes I'm walking more in darkness than I am in light. We're called to be children of light. Another question, how is your light shining in this dark world? Let's not lose focus, let's not lose perspective, but let's know our identity and let's know our destiny, church. We have an identity in Jesus Christ and because of that we have a destiny. But every person on this earth has a destiny. It's heaven or it's hell. And let us guard our faith. Oh, that our love for His great appearing might be contagious. May we live as children of light. May we speak a message of truth as we look toward that great appearing. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father, thank you. I close where I started. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the grave. You have taught us, Lord, how to live straight in a crooked world. This world was just as corrupt and just as broken and just as fallen and just as depraved when you walked it as we walk it today. And yet, Lord, we see what you took on in order that you might deliver your people. And Father, I pray for where we've fallen asleep spiritually that we might wake up, Lord. For where we have become contaminated by the things of this world that we would, in repentance and confession, clean up. And Lord, for where we've let our guard down and our hearts open to the attack of the enemy, that we would dress up and be ready for battle. Be ready for the trumpet of the Lord. Because Lord, surely we are in the last days. And oh God, may we be so burdened for those who say peace and safety. For those who as was in the days of Noah going on 
with their lives as though tomorrow will always be there. That you would wake us up as a church to be telling people that heaven is real, but hell is just as real. Oh Lord, may we respond. May we be broken. May we be burdened for lost souls. And oh Jesus, may we seek to walk in the light. May we seek to shine bright in a dark world. May we not look to this world for hope because this world cannot offer us hope. Only Jesus brings hope. And only Jesus brings forgiveness of sin and salvation. And so, Lord, may you by your Holy Spirit enable us to live as children of light, speaking a message of truth as we look towards your return. And lastly, friend, if you're here today, and you've been walking in darkness. And you've been living as though life will go on forever. Will you stop and consider Jesus today? He's coming back for his bride. His desire is that none should perish. That's the whole reason he came and he died and rose again. Because he doesn't want sin to take us to the depth of hell. If you're here today, would you consider Jesus? The Bible says if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and to forgive us of unrighteousness. And if you're here today and you want to make that decision, you just make it in your heart. It's between you and God. And then, friend, get living for Jesus and get ready because he's coming soon. Oh, may your church be found ready and waiting that we might love your great appearing. We ask in your name. Amen.